Thanks a lot, Luca, for the introduction. Before I start, I want to thank um, a bunch of people that helped a lot um, setting this pipeline up. Uh, I want to start by thanking Luca for organizing this great workshop and, and for, for inviting me to, to, to speak here and also for, for allowing me to, to give a few comments on the organization um, along the way. Um, Luca also provided this data set that we're going to use uh, today in, in my pipe, part of the analysis. It was one of three. Um, data sets that uh, Laminaus, the Leia Dinner Group, uh, kind of highlighted as a potential test bed playground to, to kind of like benchmark your analysis protocols. We were naive in selecting that uh, in the sense that it's based on MP2 rich, which is not a standard as, as we thought. Um, I also want to thank Remy Gao, who um, curates that data set and puts it into bits format and, and um, in the data lab structure. I want to thank Stefan Bollmann, who provides the server instance that we're going to use tomorrow. It's kind of doing everything in the browser, which should turn out to be easy, and hopefully it will be. And I want to thank Farouk Gang. It's touching the cable again. Are you seeing it? Okay. Um, I want to thank Farouk Gang and Paul for developing the, the code that I'm going to use, but also for providing feedback on this pipeline as well as three. And there are a few pre-recorded videos of the individual parts of this pipeline that you can look at here in the slides. All right, um, so tomorrow we will not use the, the server from CMRR. We can if you want to, I will ask you, if you decide to, to um, participate in this part of the, the hands-on. Um, but I think I would also like to show you the Neurodesk, the, the way of doing it in the browser, where you only need a GitHub login. So if you don't have one, um, generate one, or we'll do that together tomorrow. The data are available <laughs> on the server already, on each server, also on the browser server, and, and you can also download them here to your local machine if you want right now to, to browse them a bit. All right, so I'm going to use Laney in combination with Afni. And Laney is a C++-based suite of, of little programs that are specifically dedicated for layer-dependent fMRI. And there are installation instructions or tutorials, explanations of the algorithms uh, right there. And Laney is trying to solve a specific problem, which I call the, the beer-wine dilemma, that uh, maybe it refers to Gopi's comment earlier with respect to conventional fMRI, that in conventional fMRI, it has been standardized and optimized over decades. So it gives you data that um, can be pushable through standardized pipelines, like done by multinational brands of beer corporation. It just works, right? You, it, it works. For layer fMRI, that's not always given. In layer-dependent fMRI, we really push the hardware as much as possible. We optimize it, and we end up with messy data. And there is no clear standardized pipeline yet, I believe. And maybe there never will be, because we will always be pushing. We always want more. So it's more like wine, that, that there's not kind of a Henry Ford assembly line production possible, but you always need a bit more tweaking and, and tuning, and like based on the region, or based on the year, or the weather, or the climate, whatever. You need a, a few more um, knobs to turn, and I want to give you a bit of a feel of what kind of knobs you can turn in, in Laney. Overall, um, each step of the analysis pipeline will be very simple. It's not kind of fancy. It will not produce nice images, but it's always nifty in, nifty out. So we have a, a 3D volume that can be kind of a, a time series or a structural scan. We will give it a command. The command does something with it and spits out a nifty. And by command, I mean a little program that we will execute in the terminal. So um, on the server, either within the browser or on the CMRR server, we basically have this little black box, the terminal, which has, and then execute a command that has an input nifty file and output nifty file. And maybe um, to get a feel um, about uh, um, kind of the level of expertise, who has ever used a terminal or like this little black box uh, bash? So um, many, but not everybody. Okay, so we can talk about kind of how to use that. Um, and we have dedicated time for that. Right. All right, um, so this is my roadmap, pipeline, outline, how you call it, um, of how layer fMRI works and pretty much matches what, what previous speakers showed. So we have the data from the scanner, four-dimensional NIFTIs, time series that we need to correct for motion. Then we convert these time series into activation maps, the GLM, for example. And you can do some cleaning um, of those activation maps if you want. 
ultimately we want to analyze those activation scores in the 3D space based like within the gray matter. So for that, we need to know which voxel is in gray matter, CSF and white matter. And you can use uh, the structural reference scan, for example, um, to um, aid you in that decision. Um, but for that, it needs to be aligned. Ultimately, when we have the functional activation scores in our voxels that we know are gray matter or not, we can convert those gray matter labels into layers, extract the signal, and do our statistics at the end. So I think the later part over here is really the, the layer fMRI specific part. So in the first 45 minutes, if you want to do um, the Laney um, pipeline, we will focus on the layer fMRI specific part. And I will particularly focus not on kind of how do you get the best out of the best out of the best, but something that works. I want to give you an overview of the logistics of what are kind of the data that we work with, how do we, which knobs we turn until we, we get our kind of conclusion at the end. Right. And I've published many papers of this, even though it's not really optimized and we will be um, a bit fishy here and there, but it's something that works and that you, I think, can really use for any kind of data that you throw at it. Um, maybe in the second 45 minutes, we can talk about uh, kind of noise cleaning. Um, then we can talk about this uh, semi-manual registration, which I think um, will be very similar compared to what Anna showed, but in, in ITK Snap. And also I will talk uh, briefly about um, the specific um, knobs I turn when I do kind of slab layer fMRI um, alignment across runs. The data set that we are going to work with is um, this data set. It's, uh, I think, fairly standard and comparable to, to what Anna and Julia are doing. It's 0.8 millimeter. It's a visual cortex and protocol. It's, I think, fairly high um, temporal resolution for layers. And it also comes along with the whole brain MP2 range. And for ease of, of kind of going through it tomorrow, I will also provide a kind of roughly aligned structural scan on top of it. The functional conditions that we're going to analyze are um, two conditions. It's a visual stimulation where we have kind of task condition one, fixation, task condition two, fixation, task condition one, fixation, and so on. And they activate different patches of the cortex, or um, in other words, they also activate the same voxel, but differently and differently across cortical layers. So we want to see how a given patch of the cortex is differently activated for those two different task conditions. And we will, just for the sake of it, choose any patch of the calcarine sulcus, like, for example, the highlighted one here. And those are the two task conditions, basically uh, a tilted, tipped over diamond. All right. So let's go into details a bit um, of these individual pipelines. Let's look at this um, layer-specific part of the pipeline and how we are going to do that. So first of all, um, we will um, use the server, I think you can see it here, to um, load a structural scan and select our RI, and we will do a manual segmentation only across few slices. Um, depending on how big your RI is, that might be doable um, within a um, few minutes or hours. Tomorrow, for the sake of the logistics and the pipeline, we will only do one or two slices in ITK Snap, basically labeling the gray matter CSF border and the gray matter white matter border, and then convert that into layers with a specific Laney command that I will go through um, in a second. But first of all, I want to kind of um, justify the choice of doing a manual segmentation. And in fact, um, there was a lot of discussion going on there um, last week, where um, specifically Farouk Gülban um, highlighted the need of manual um, uh, corrections of segmentation. I think the overall conclusion last week was that, especially when you have large coverages, it would take too long to do everything manual. So we need to have a good starting point with automatic segmentation. But then, since they are not good enough, it's almost always necessary to do some form of um, manual intervention. And it's a pity that Cheryl is not there and, and can um, comment on that. So overall, manual segmentations are annoying. It takes a lot of time, like a lot of time. In my last study, whole brain, um, a student was just sitting there for a single brain 60 hours. And it was not the best segmentation. And he was really good and skilled and got, got like good at, with it with a manual drawing board. It just takes a lot of time. Um, However, of course, as soon as you do manual segmentation, it's not reproducible, right? Maybe when you drank coffee, you're slightly better. So next time you do it, 
or when your neighbor does it, it you might get a sl slightly different result. So it's not a reproducible in the sen sense that you get the same results. However, maybe you don't want reproducibility, which sounds weird. But um, for example, when you when you run the same uh, automatic segmentation multiple times, you get the same result that is reproducibly wrong. You don't want that either, right? Um, so, uh, and Farouk specifically made the point of, of Cajal, who his entire life spent just with manual drawings. He made this point that you need to kind of conceptualize uh, in your head what the 3D structure looks like, and then you go in manually and draw. And you can win a Nobel Prize by just drawing stuff. Um, and also, like, um, I think Daniel made the uh, kind of comment, and this is maybe the same data that, that Anna showed, where you can, like, what do you do as a good scientist when you see that it's not right, right? You can fine tune, but still now gray matter seems to be half a voxel thick, right? We have, I think, three choices, right? We can either disregard the subject, um, which sometimes would mean that we would need to disregard 99% of our data. We are not good scientists if we don't have data. So the second choice would be to live with it, and are reproducibly wrong, or, or the, the, um, the last choice then would be to like go in, and as soon as we see something, then do something about it. So correct for it manually. All right, so next I can go through the, the specific layerification command um, that we're gonna use to convert these manual orders into layers. And one of the things that um, we need to choose, or we can choose, um, is the number of layers. And I think we will use uh, 10 layers. And there was a discussion, I think, in the last decade of the field that how many layers to use, and, and, and because the number of layers is not um, directly connected to the effective um, spatial resolution. However, however, I think that overall in the field, the conclusion emerged that it's always advantageous to use more layers than your effective spatial resolution, because you will always introduce additional blurring if you use less layers than your effective uh, um, spatial resolution. And this is highlighted here in this synthetic data set where we have a, a double stripe in a motor cortex. And you see that we might only have like five voxels across cortical depth. But then if we only s extract five layers, we will have partial voluming, right? The, each voxel centroid is at a very specific cortical depth in a floating point accuracy. And then as soon as we only have five layers as opposed to 20 layers, both peaks kind of um, result in partial voluming. So for um, one layer, two layer, three layer, four layers, we still have an inverted U shape and only at about five layers we start to see it and at more layers we start to see this double hump clearer and clearer and clearer, which might be better visible also here. That Imagine we are not deciding on a layer number at all, right? Let's assume we just estimate our cortical depth. Each, each voxel centroid has a given cortical depth. Like this voxel over there would have a cortical depth normalized to 0.98356 something. And it also has assigned a specific activation score, which would be a 5.9 something, right? So in a 2D plot, we have one data point over there. And each voxel refers to one data point. So at the end, we actually end up with the number of layers that is identical to the number of voxels we have in our RI, which in this case kind of works because we have a nice SNR and we see double stripes with the naked eye. In real life, we don't have this. We need to average and we need to kind of bin, them, bin the voxels into kind of chunks where we can kind of um, increase our SNR by averaging. And in this case, by only having five bins, you can already see that this voxel down there actually has a different partial voluming with the middle layers as opposed to this, which would be closer to white matter. So we don't really want to kind of put them in the same bin of uh, layer groups. It would result in, in additional loss of spatial resolution, even though each point itself um, is not a point, right? It has um, already a, a limited spatial specificity. Right, and um, the other... Um, parameter of lag that I want to mention is maybe what Cheryl referred to, namely the equal count. So you can divide these um, different voxels across cortical depth into five equal chunks that are equal in the size of the bin, or you um, divide them into chunks that are have the same number of voxels. Basically, the um, lowest 20%, um, the, the next 20%, and so on. 
which sometimes can help with some statistical analyses, which might not make sense um, always to kind of make the biology fit the statistical analysis. You should rather make the um, statistical analysis fit the biology. But this is one option that can be very helpful sometimes. And just to show you two extreme cases of the number of layers, um, Farouk Gilban, um, would does not like to bin at all. So when you have 20,000 voxels in your RI here for structural scans, then he has 20,000 layers, which is, is a bit hard to work with. The other extreme very often in neuroscientific application studies is that neuroscientists um, bin their cortical depth into kind of the neuroscientifically motivated layer group. So this is uh, an example where basically the, there was an input and output layer, two layers, and they only looked at that. And there are many things uh, wrong with, with doing that. Um, one is, for example, that not all the superficial voxels um, are similarly superficial, right? They're, the superficial voxel might have voxels that are just above the, the midline, right? So they are bent here, even though they have partial voluming with the deeper layer. So it would more, make more sense to exclude these middle voxels or ma make them a third bin. The second thing that's really wrong here is to do statistics across layers. I think we cannot, and this is quite established in kind of structural, uh, in conventional fMRI, that you cannot do really say that V1 is uh, stronger activated than V5 because you have stronger beta scores there. We know that different layers or different areas have different vascular reactivity, so um, we cannot really do statistics across layers. We should rather do statistics within the layer across conditions. And I can say that this is wrong because this is from one of my studies. Um, the next thing in this layerification um, that we specifically like, specify with this flag here is equivolume. And we heard about this already a bit, I think, from also from Julia, maybe, Cheryl, I, I forgot. Um, so it's basically the idea or the algorithm on how you um, divide the gray matter into like the, the different layer groups based on the border of white matter and CSF. So here you see in an ex vivo high resolution T2 star weighted scan that we have this striatinari here following the cortical ribbon and you see that there's something weird happening that that at the crown of a gyrus um, the dark line is kind of very close to CSF whereas at the bottom of a sulcus it's closer to white matter and the mathematical description has been provided from Thomas Siegfried Bock as the so-called equivolume principle basically claiming that for each column each unit column a given layer must have a conserved volume so basically if the column is wider at the um, gray matter CSF borderline then it has a, th a thinner column is this me um, as opposed to the bottom of a sulcus. And you can see this here for equidistance layers when you just divide the Euclidean distance in 3D space and then half it, we see that it matches when the cortex is straight, but there's this curvature bias that sometimes we are kind of not really capturing the, this dark line. Um, whereas when you do the equivoluming, then it fits kind of better, especially visible in these very, very high spatial resolutions. In practice, I, I think you can, I would like to explain it based on this metaphor that you know Star Wars, where we have the chosen one that actually turned bad. It was fixable and turned good, but, but at the end it doesn't matter, right? The story goes on. So for, for equivolume, I think we have this elegant theory. In practice, when you want to work with it, it's hard and it actually, you, you end up having a lot of uh, like problems because any kind of segmentation noise or discretization noise is just amplified. It interprets it as, as curvature and tries to amplify it. You can fix it with smoothing, but at the end, it just doesn't matter. For the resolutions that we have, you get very, very, very similar results out of it. Uh, to make this a bit clearer, um, like one specific sample is when you have changes in curvature. So this is a tiny patch of a monkey visual cortex that can be very straight and then it turns around around almost like half circle and then you see it for the straight we have these equally sized layers and then when the curvature changes now the, the deepest layer needs to be thicker so we have these discontinuities in biology we don't have them and in fact in biology when you look at the microscope you see that the the columns are kind of bent they account for it making it kind of smooth how this transition goes so in the algorithm then you can also have this smoothing um, parameter that kind of smooths this out. And this fixes other issues too. For example, 
when you work in voxel space, which Lainey does, because it's always nifty in, nifty out. Um, you have these kind of borderlines between gray matter and CSF, which is always kind of locked to the borders of voxels. So there's a limit in accuracy there. And then when you have these kind of jumps of the discretization, the algorithm, algorithm interprets this as curvature and tries to account for it with the equivalent principle. So as soon as you kind of smooth it, um, you are kind of in a different spatial regime of, of and not limited to the kind of voxel discretization. You can also account for it by, by upsampling, which, which um, we usually do. But those are the kind of issues that we have as, so, as soon as we go to the equivolume principle. And, and to show you the example here for the equal counts, like um, sometimes when, the, when you have kissing chiri, you see that the uppermost layer it's not really continuous in voxel space. So if you use the equal counts option to make sure that each layer has the same number of voxels, you can um, account for that. As soon as we have our layers estimated, then we can extract the signal with the Eleni program LN2 profile, which literally just looks at all the voxels that are in a given cortical layer estimated and then averages them and writes them out in a text file. And it's no fancy um, visualization, but, but there is a visualization. Then last is how do we use those layer profiles and, and do statistics with them? And we have a few issues there because, um, as I said, we usually extract more um, more layers, then we have spatial resolution, so our layer profiles are always smooth. And they're not statistically independent because we know that each voxel has like partial voluming with the neighboring layers. So how do we do statistics? We cannot use them as independent data points with multiple comparison corrections. So um, the solution, I think, is to use um, methods that basically assume that the data are smooth. For example, the PTA, the profile tracking analysis implemented in AFNI, specifically for the purpose of smooth data points, where you know that the data are not statistically independent and can be on an irregular grid for that matter. Right, and it basically just estimates the smoothness based on the data itself developed from GANG. And it's kind of um, using the, the methodology that has been developed over decades in the temporal domain in fMRI and, and converting it to the spatial domain. So for example, for um, temporal statistics, we have our voxel time course on a regular grid. Each DR, we have a new sample. Then we have uh, different task conditions, for example, rest and activity. We fit our model and, and get our beta scores in a GLM, for example. Now in um, layer fMRI, we are actually not that different. We are slightly different, though. For example, um, if we are interested in this patch crown of a gyrus, then we would expect, based on our hypothesis, that maybe we have two layers. And you can do a similar analysis, of course. The difference, though, is that we are usually not on this, like, on this regular grid of TRs. It could be that, just based on where the voxels are with respect to the sample that you have, uh, like, um, irregular voxel distributions, but also on top of that, you have different density. For example, at the crown of a, of a gyrus, you have just more voxels that are on the gray matter CSF border as opposed to gray matter white matter border. But GLM doesn't require that you are on a regular grid, right? It doesn't require that you have equally sampled um, data points. It's just how it's implemented usually in, in temporal um, analyses of GLM. So in the PTA that we're going to use tomorrow, you're not sent, like you're, you can push any data through it. And the data, how they are gonna look is something like that, where we have two input files. And the first input file is basically um, a file that gives you all the layer profiles for all the runs, for example. And um, the first row, I'm not sure if you can see this, um, would be the run. The second row would be the layer. The, the third row would be the value of that, um, the specific functional contrast in that run, in that layer, and so on. And then the second input would be basically the prediction. What do we want to have? So we use here the runs as a random effect. We are interested in the layer and the condition between the different layers. And basically, the output is then for any given run that we assume to be the same uh, because we model them as random effects. Um, we, want to, we want that to have it as an output. So the out two output files are the statistical file, giving us basically a statistical um, certainty of how likely it is that those two um, task conditions are uh, different. Uh, the second row is the, I think, more interesting one because it tells us not only if a task condition is, um, activates the cortex stronger than another one, but basically it tells us 
um, if the shape is different. So we don't care in layer-dependent fMRI as much whether um, two layer fMRI profiles are scaled versions from each other. What we care more about is whether different layers are differently engaged during the different task conditions, which is the, the second row over here. And then we have the, the prediction, which is basically the, the input to with assigned values on it, which you could also get, for example, if you just average all the, all the different runs. But it also estimates this, um, the standard error based on the smoothness that it are estimated. So in these first 45 minutes, we're basically going to go through those commands in the terminal. And we, so we learn how to use the terminal, how to use programs. We will draw our layers in ITK Snap, then estimate the layers extract the profiles and do statistics with them. So actually, it's only those five commands that we're going to do that are actually doing something. And I hope we can do this in 45 minutes. Then in the next um, 45 minutes, um, I think I would want to go through different noise cleaning methods. We can actually change the order. So if there's more interest in doing kind of alignment first or motion correction, we can also do that. Um, but definitely, we will also have time to do some noise cleaning. And this is maybe something that Anna already has alluded to, to like that very often we just have very noisy data that might look like something like that. And we want to use them to some degree. For um, One scenario is, is something that Anna proposed, namely that we have one run and we want to use those noisy data to guide us in saying which sulcus should we use in our RI for the analysis of the later runs. Another um, scenario might be that you are setting up your layer fMRI um, paradigm, you're doing your pilots, and then you just don't know if it actually works in your scanner. You're not worried about SNR later down the line because you are going to acquire 20 participants, so you will not be as SNR limited anymore, but you want to know is my task actually activating the area of interest, the sulcus of interest, which is hard looking at those kind of data, right? We, there's something going on here. It's not really clear if the entire sulcus is activated. Maybe there's something going on, maybe here. But if this is going on, then we actually also should trust that one. So we want to convert that into something that, that looks like that with a series of filtering, where you do see that actually those things, they are not surviving, but instead, there seems to be something here that's below the detection threshold, or maybe if you uh, look at it retrospectively, um, it actually does survive all that filtering. And it's not the entire sulcus here that seems to be activated, only patches of it. So this might guide us in our um, RI selection for, for later. And specifically, we're going to use Nordic that we heard about. We're going to use layer-specific smoothing and also clustering, which are, I think, the three most commonly used ways of doing um, filtering in layer fMRI. There are many more ways on how you can do layer fMRI uh, filtering. And maybe each lab has their own thing, but only very few of them, I think, ever caught on. Right. Um, as soon as you do filtering, um, your life gets hard because reviewers will not like it. They're always afraid that as soon as you do some noise cleaning, um, you put some features into the data that have not been there originally. And rightfully so, right? So you need to be convincing that this way of filtering is actually OK. And it doesn't just um, make your data uh, less interpretable. And in some way, it will be less interpretable because every filter is based on assumptions. And they might be violated. So you need to make sure that they're not violated. And it's more work as soon as you do this kind of filtering because you need to look at it filtered and unfiltered and then have maybe extra supplementary material and to make sure that nothing bad happens. So in an ideal world, we wouldn't need to do this, right? In an ideal world, the data would be just good enough that they just work. But we are not in an ideal world. We have messy data and noisy data. So um, the specific reasons why I want to show you how to do these um, denoisings is that, as I said, because sometimes we just need to know if a given sulcus is activated or engaged for a given task or not. But also, I want to give you a feel of kind of how to interpret data that are presented to you. Very often, people show kind of glittery slides. And then you don't really understand all the details of the methodology, or they hide it, or whatever. So I want to, you to kind of get a feel of, if I, you try it at home, the same thing that you see on a slide, that there might actually be a bit, a bit of filtering to, to, or don't be alarmed if on, on your own scanner you're not getting the data and nice slide uh, images that you, you are used to seeing on slides, because maybe some of those filterings were applied. 
So what we're going to do in the second 45 minutes is first do some quality metric analysis of a time series, uh, look at kind of um, judgments of deciding is this given data set a good data set or not. We will do a GLM, basically converting time series into activation maps. It will look noisy, so we will do Nordic. And again, doing GLM to see how much it improved. Then we will do um, smoothing on top of the Nordic denoise data and GLM again to see how much it improved. And then even do a bit of cluster thresholding to see um, if that can improve the data quality further. So let's talk a bit about uh, um, the background of these individual uh, methods. And, and this is a slide um, I borrowed from Luca about uh, the overall framework of Nordic that Cheryl already kind of um, alluded to. Um, so basically in Nordic, you are, the first thing that happens is that you normalize the data based on your G factor. So in fMRI, if you do acceleration, you don't expect that the noise is spatially homogeneous. In Nordic, you kind of assume that, um, or in the, in the thresholding at least. So what Nordic does is estimate the G factor and then normalize it to have a s smooth noise uh, scaling across your space, then um, it basically works on a patch by patch basis, um, sorts this into these matrices, and then do, does the PCA, where it then rejects all the components that are indistinguishable from thermal noise, recombines all the patches, and undoes the grappa normalization, again, the chief factor normalization. Right. Um, let's talk also about the principle of layer smoothing. So basically when you have very, very noisy data, you only smooth voxels that are within the same cortical depth locally. And the um, thing that you lose by doing that is basically any resolution across the columnar domain. So it can be very convincing to make sure that the activity that you're seeing is actually at a given cortical layer, but you basically lose any like, yeah, resolution in the spatial dimension orthogonal to that. And as you can see here, it can make a very noisy data kind of usable, for example, also for ROI selection. There are a few quirks with this that Anna already um, showed you, namely we don't want this kind of smoothing to be just in volume space um, where we are only smoothing basically within a mask of um, the same layer across kissing chiri. So there's a minus kissing option in there to only like smooth within kind of a given layer that are um, connected to each other. There are different ways of doing um, layer specific smoothing. And one of the things was um, discussed earlier over lunch where we talked about kind of these non-isotropic uh, diffusion filters. They're basically also in Laney, you can do smoothing by not um, smoothing within layers because to get layers is annoying, right? For layers, you need to have segmentation and to have segmentation is just painful. Um, so another approach is basically to only smooth within v v like voxels that have the same value. For example, in a reference data set, when you have a T1 API, for example, or any structural scan, you can um, only like estimate your smoothing kernel based on Euclidean distance, like in Gaussian smoothing, but then have an additional penalty function based on like the similarity of the volume value in that voxel. So to only yeah, smooth in similar intensities and different layers happen to have similar T1 intensities, for example. All right, so we have two more um, blocks that we can go through um, tomorrow. Let's talk about uh, alignment, which is, I think, very, very similar to, as I said, what, what Anna did. So in ITK Snap, we will load a very thin slab, and that's usually hard, because if you don't have an entire volume, um, then like the, the registration algorithm sometimes put your data completely out of, of your frame of reference. So we will uh, learn to tweak a bit these uh, different parameters, different cost functions, red, like the rigid or affine, or also the resolutions of your tuning to get a kind of good initial moving transform, which then you can put to further algorithms, for example, ANS registration. Or you can also um, use it just like that, for example, if it's good enough in your area of interest. And I received feedback from, from Shri, he taught me how to do that. And then uh, lastly, we can talk about the alignment and motion correction, um, which I think very often people are super worried about in layer-dependent fMRI. I'm not too worried about it. Um, maybe I'm just privileged with uh, participants that I can selectively in invite that, and only have participants that don't move too much. So this is a common emotion 
um, a case that I, I see it in my scans. Those are eight runs, I think, um, across two hours, where I'm, the movie is across the eight different runs. And you can see that there's motion, right? It's actually quite a bit of motion. And just as a reference, if I don't do any motion correction, I would end up with a mean image that looks something like that, right? It's blurry. It's not perfect. But hand on your heart, right? You still know that even without any motion correction, that let's say this voxel over here has a higher probability of being most of the time in deeper layers. Whereas this voxel over here has a higher probability of mostly being in the upper layers. So even not doing any motion correction, we see some structure still, right? It can't be that bad. And so I think you can tweak most of your, the algorithms, the standard algorithms that have been estimated for and, and developed for three Tesla, three millimeter imaging, um, and, and tune it a bit for, for layer-dependent fMRI. And I want to show you how I tune it. So for example, in SPM motion correction, you have this option of doing a motion mask that then only um, estimates the displacement within that mask. And you can see that it kind of works okay. There's still a bit of uh, movement happening. It's not perfect. And sometimes we even have these edge enhancements depending on the interpolation. Then I try to do the same thing in AFNI. Um, you can see that sometimes it just does not work at all, right? It, it, it flickers, and which means that basically the entire volume kind of is, is pushed away. And that's very common in layer-dependent fMRI because we ha do have these thin slabs. And we do have the thin slabs very often because we um, like want to have high spatial resolution, and we need to trade that off um, if we want to have um, reasonable TRs. So the approach that I'm going to show you tomorrow is the most right one, which is using a estimated motion mask with AFNI, the 3D alineate specifically, where um, we generate a brain mask where we kind of pad and, and erode the outermost slices. And then you can see that it works pretty nice. It works slightly better than the standard approach here. However, with the additional feature of, of needing to generate those masks. And we will generate these kind of masks in AFNI with a series of, of very brief commands and then use these motion masks in uh, 3D Alineate. And we will go through that um, in a specific run. And then also I'll show you how you can script it and then have it automatically done. All right, uh, last slide almost. So I want to kind of embed this pipeline with respect to kind of what's being um, discussed in the field. So. We talked a lot about manual and, and automatic segmentation, so I will not talk about that. I think usually you need to look at your data because like, your eyes are the ultimate ground truth at the end. And even Cheryl right, said you need to check your quality and look at your data. But then as soon as you look at your data, you're not going to say, okay, this is bad, let's go on. Like, if you look at it, it means that you're doing something. You, um, you do have interventions. One thing that we didn't talk too much about, only as a side note, I think, is that um, each spatial interpolation step results in, in blurring and, and signal leakage and leakage of noise from one voxel to the neighboring voxels. And there's an excellent lecture from Jonathan Polimeni from last week, and he allowed me to, to share um, the link to that lecture to you. Right. Um, overall, I think also with respect to um, Kopi Krishna's um, comment, I think layer from my analysis has come a long way. When, when I started it a while ago, there were no tools out there. So now you can choose between four different pipelines. Um, each of them is not perfect, and each of them can give you the right neuroscience conclusion at the end. And uh, as I said and we discussed, I think there's no complete consensus yet about fMRI prep, because I think the, the deal breaker is the MP2 rich. So I think for a future standard data set, to get towards fMRI prep, we need a data set that has a T1EPI and the MP, MP rich membrane um, in the future. Right. And maybe as you saw it already, my pipeline that um, we're going to go through um, tomorrow is really kind of maybe clunky and then you need to tweak a bit, but it is optimized uh, for generalizability. So you can put any even line scanning data into it and, and you will get something out of it. All right. And with that, I want to emphasize again that we will use the layer.neurodesk.org um, server. And if I do have two minutes, I will quickly um, um, show you how to do that. So in your browser, in any browser, um, for example, that one. OK, this is a bit awkward. So I will do it like that. So if you type in a layer dot neuro 
helpdesk.org, um, you will get to a Jupyter notebook. Okay, I'm um, sorry, I need a, um, I'm already logged in, so maybe I open an incognito window. You will need to um, sign it with, with a GitHub, and maybe I can do that real quick. Um, let's use that one. And now I need a verification code. So. All right. So that's why we need um, um, a GitHub account. And there's my verification code. I want to show you the, the framework so you can test it, and if it doesn't work for you, uh, we can uh, fix it. So now it asks me to give access, um, few access to my GitHub um, metadata to Stefan Bollmann, which we need um, to run it, so I authorize that. And then I can um, use the standard environment, we don't need any GPUs or something, and start it. Now it's um, starting the server for me. And this might take a few seconds, I hope. Right. And, and the reason why I'm going to do that, even though you go all through all the struggle of the CMRR server, is because I want you to be able to take whatever we did um, at this workshop, go home and continue with that. Ultimately, it would make most sense that you like install all the software on your local machine, on your server, anything like that. But um, kind of to, to get more familiar with it and also to kind of decide which kind of uh, features across the pipelines you want to pick and choose, um, this might be an easy way. So now I have this uh, Jupyter notebook open and I want to open a Neurodesk, which was the little brain over the, the little container, and you can choose any resolution that you want. And now, and this is uh, necessary in order to allow it to copy paste between your main system and the server. And now this is our little uh, neural desk. So we will be able to kind of go through our, um, it's very hard to see from here. You have all the kind of applications in layer dependent fMRI or, or fMRI in general. Maybe I find Laney real quick. Uh, there's Laney. Then um, kind of it starts Laney, sets all the environments and so on. And this is the, the black terminal that, that we're gonna um, work with. All right, so um, if you, want to use the, the Laney Afni approach tomorrow and um, see if you can log in to, to um, layer.neurodesk.org. If you struggle with this, there is a fallback option where you don't need a login. I would prefer, prefer this one. And with this, I thank you for your attention and, and yeah, look forward to questions. Thank you.